You were telling me about what he's saying, do you know, is it awake, you don't know, well, before the day's out, let me know what the address is and the time, I'm going to be there, Tommy's going to be there, okay, all right, one more opportunity to witness to my nephew, so, good morning, good to see you guys this morning, um, Ben is preaching um, over at Brother St. John's. Sister Vicki, you hear from Howard how that meeting's going? Yeah. I, I don't know the other guys. I do know Brother Walker. Brother Walker's a good man. Um, he's uh, one of those young men that I just got all over. <laughs> so, I mean, just be honest about it. All right, there's anything this morning, anything we need to do come up? Anything? Yes. This is why I can't stay on a diet. But I think I can fight off the chili. <laughs> anyway, if you want uh, to get involved in it, they're having a chili cook-off. I don't know what that is. It's like uh, fighting with each other over chili. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, um, pray for Ben. Pray God will use him uh, where he's at. Um, anything, anything, I'm not used to doing this anymore. I'm sorry? No street preaching today, okay? Um, 
typically when we, it, in Pensacola, you don't think it gets cold, but it does. Uh, typically, they'll pull them off the street for a period of time. There's two reasons behind that. One of them is the weather. Number two is that give it a break for a while, and, and then you can start it back up. And So they take, what, a month or two off like that, something like that, and then they go back at it. But there will be no street preaching uh, today. Nursing home, do you hear any more about that? Second week in March. Um, I guess they're trying to bring COVID back. I don't know. Um, oh, they had, they had people come in, but they didn't have a slot for y'all. Okay, all right. Um, Jim and Christine are away. Um, who else am I thinking of? Betty. That's a tough lady. <laughs> Gloria, she is in a wedding somewhere. Um, just pray for them. You don't see them, pray for them anyway. Um, but I think she's in a wedding down south somewhere. Florida, that's, that's south. Almost as far south as you can go. Um, if that's it, anybody got anything else? Let's get ready to take up an offering now. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Sister Crystal, pacemaker surge, uh, for that. Also, Jonathan, I talked with him at the store the other day. And it's this coming Friday at 8.30. And where is this? Where is it at? Okay. Um, he, um, he's been battling this thing with his feet ever since. I've, I've known Jarrett and Jonathan. Is that exaggeration? I know Wade about the same height. He grew up physically, just not. <laughs> um, but pray for Jonathan. He's, uh, he's, he's not one of those guys. He could probably go to the office. That's not him. He just, he's got to be busy all the time. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I can sympathize. I have to say flat feet. I don't know if there's such a thing as an arch in my foot. I don't know. Um, but my foot, feet bother me, but he has bothered him since he was a real young lad. So you be in prayer for him. All right. Anybody need an offering envelope? Gone once, twice, they're gone. Okay. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll let's go from there. Brother Steve, why don't you pray for us? Amen. 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 Hundred and four. No, that's not. That's not what I was thinking. One ninety-eight. That works. 
198. Access to me because um, the choir was such a big part of our church for so long, and we lost it for a while. And last summer, um, God put it on Jeremy Russell's heart to step forward and do this, and such a big blessing that you guys would do this with us. And I'm just thankful that we're able to do this and sing for God. Each day. Each day that I live, he's more than I need. I could never describe his goodness to me. You ask how I make it day after day. There's only one thing I can say. It's been a long journey, but I have been blessed. Walking with Jesus, I had no regrets. He's so good to me, I must confess. The way has been long, but I'm blessed. All that I need, I find at his feet. 
When I'm hungry, he feeds me with manna so sweet. When my soul is weary, he gets peace and rest. All I can say is I'm blessed. Now I've had my share of sunshine and rain. My day is filled with laughter, my night's filled with pain. But with every mile as I travel this way, the journey gets sweeter each day. It's been a long journey, but I have been blessed. Walking with Jesus, I have no regrets. He's so good to me, I must confess. The way has been long, but I'm blessed. I'm blessed. So much more than I am for Jesus. I'm blessed. He's been faithful and true to his word. I'm blessed. I've been blessed by the hand of the Lord. I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. It's been a long journey, but I have been blessed. Walking with Jesus, I have of how good God is, and um, at the end of Matthew, uh, it talks about how when they came to take Jesus, that uh, the disciples forsook him and fled, and oftentimes I remember Peter. I was caught, uh, crowed three times, but I forget that everybody else fled, and it says that he forsook him, but then two chapters later after he resurrects, the people he was closest to that betrayed him, he goes and he finds them. And, he, and he's like, I'm going to give you the power to go do things for me. And um, it reminds me of us how, you know, we try to get close to the Lord and uh, fail him. And yet he comes right back and he gives you another opportunity, another chance. And I'm thankful that he rose. <clears throat> Sunday morning in Jerusalem. Three days since Jesus died for our sins. But something's happened at the tomb where he lay. He came forth and when the storm rolled away. I don't serve a dead Savior. I don't have a dead faith. He's alive and so am I, brought forth from the grave. There is victory for the claiming every day and every hour. Praise to live forevermore in resurrection power. Now I'm no longer what I used to be. My past is buried, and my soul is free. Even, Even death could never take my lasting hope. Heaven's mine, for my Redeemer rose. I don't serve a dead Savior. I don't have a dead faith. He's alive and so
I can clearly see Paul, a man who gave God his all. And as he sits in his cell, just waiting to die, to anyone who listen, I can hear him cry that, that there ain't nothing better than Jesus. He's all I need in this world below. No, there ain't nothing better than Jesus. His love for me, well, it just seems to grow. When I'm down, when I'm out, and I just don't think I'll make it, no, there ain't nothing better than him. Now I haven't seen much of this world, no diamonds, no rubies, no pearls, but have seen what Paul saw, and I feel the same. So I'll sing it and I'll shout it, oh Lord, I'll proclaim. And someday I'll be in glory with Jesus and the others gone before me. And as I walk down the streets of gold and hear the praises ring, oh, maybe Paul will join me, and together we will sing that there ain't nothing better than Jesus. He's all I need in this world below. No, there ain't nothing better than Jesus. His love for me, well, it just seems to grow. When I'm down, when I'm out, and I just don't think I'll make it, no, there ain't nothing better than him. When I'm down, when I'm out, and I just don't think I'll make it, no, there ain't nothing better than him. When I got saved, I came out of Catholicism. I never heard much about the second coming of Jesus Christ. I heard about um, hell, um, purgatory. How many of y'all remember purgatory? You remember that? Okay. Uh, you know what purgatory is? <laughs> you go to hell, they claim, because you, you sin, but yet depends on what sin you sin that you go to purgatory and you can burn them off. Um, remember the rich man and, the, and the, the publican and one was in hell and he couldn't get him out? Um, he must have messed up. But one of the things that excites me to preach about, um, this world's in a mess. It really just, every time you turn around, I mean, this is happening, that's happening, and nobody seems to have a remedy to fix it. I have the remedy to take care of it. Even so come, Lord Jesus. That'll take care of everything, every bit of it. So I want to preach to you on the thought this morning, if you will, on some something that the second coming ought to do for every Christian. 
Look at, uh, if you would, the Bible, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look in your Bible. Now, as far as I know, everybody in here is S-A-V-E-D. I'm happy for it. Amen. I'm glad you're saved. But I catch myself every once in a while, I said, what are you doing? Um, I'm saved, but am I serving? You say, well, you're preaching. You're a preacher. I'm saved, but I'm serving. What am I doing? What have I done for God? Uh, I get to preach. I love to preach. I'm probably not that good at it, but I enjoy doing it. Like that little boy said, Mom, I've been called to preach. He said, how do you know? He says, uh, I, I'd rather preach at them than them preach at me. <laughs> Nobody wants to be preached at sometimes. A little boy uh, was had a thought there. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Some things I want to preach to you on this morning is some things the second coming ought to do. How many would love to see Jesus Christ come right now? For the service, so we can just go on, go to glory, and get out of here. Would that satisfy you? Amen. No more trials and troubles and tribulations. No more deaths. Brother Ron's just telling me about uh, uh, one of his co-workers has uh, uh, passed away, I guess, and uh, there's a, they have an awake, right? I hope they're awake. <laughs> but um, my nephew's probably going to be there, so I'm going to do everything I can to be there so I can talk to him one more time. Um, but... You know, the Lord came over, came back in, in Acts chapter 2, and uh, he talked about this same Jesus shall come back in like manner. He went back up. Remember that? And uh, it, it did something for his disciples. And I, I want to ask you a question. What do you think the second coming ought to mean to your life? It ought to do something for you and for me. Look at chapter 4. Look at verse uh, 13, if you would, please. But I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep. Now, these are not people that are ignorant. They're just ignorant of the second coming. Concerning them asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died for and rose, excuse me, again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. Now, look what he says. This isn't something he picked up off the street. He said, for this we say unto, uh, unto you by what? By what? So you got God's word on it. The Bible says God's not a man. He should lie to you, son of man. He needs to repent, right? So God's word on it, he's telling you. And you say, why do you emphasize that? Because there is people out there today that preaching, oh, no, he's, he's not coming back. When he comes back, he's going to be mad and people going to hell. And you can, no. no. He's going to come rule and reign and judge. Amen. The word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself, God's not sending someone else. He's not asking. He's coming. He's coming down. What is he coming for? His bride. He's coming to get us out of here. How do you know it? Well, would you not suggest that hell won't be a comfort? You can answer that question. <laughs> Would you not suggest that hell's not going to be a comfort? There's weeping and wailing and mashing the teeth in hell. Now watch this. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God. And what? The dead in Christ shall rise first, right? Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air. in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, in light of what you just heard, what you just read, in light of that, wherefore, comfort one another with those words we just read. Are you comfortable with the fact he's coming? Are you looking forward to that coming? 
you know what, we'll get out of here and everything will be fine. We'll be likened unto his glorious body. We'll live where he lives. We'll eat what he eats. For eternity, we'll be with him. Now, what are you preaching on, preacher? In light of all that, in light of it, what's the second coming really mean to you? Father, we love you, and we pray, God, now that you would take the message and do what I can't do, Lord. Do something with it. Lord, it's just a bunch of words and verses, but help us, Lord, to get convicted that we need to do something for you. But it's not just about our safety. We're saved. We're on our way to heaven. The Bible says we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But, Lord, what about people that are dying? What about people that are unsaved? Help us to do something for them in Jesus' name. You look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 19, it says, For what is our hope, now watch, and joy or crown of rejoicing, are not even ye in the presence of our, our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. You know what he's trying to tell you there? He's trying to, Paul is saying, my crown is going to be the people that I have won to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what my crown's going to be. That's what it's going to be all about. Listen, let me, you know what it ought to motivate? It ought to motivate you. Uh, and sales work, when I was in sales, Jim was in sales, we both did management, we both did sales. And when I was in sales, they always tried to give you an incentive to motivate you. I remembered uh, one of my sales managers. I didn't get along with them too well because they didn't like my response to them. He said, uh, how many units you're going to sell for the month? I said, as many as the Lord lets me. That's not the answer he wanted. I'm not talking about your religion. I said, I'm not religious. I'm saved. There's a difference. I, <laughs> there's all kinds of religion. There's only one Savior. Amen. And so I told him, I said, I don't know. I have no idea. Well, you're going to sell 15, 20? I said, as many as the Lord will allow me. Let me ask you a question. If you know that the Lord would come in tomorrow, would you change anything in your life? If you knew 12 o'clock tomorrow, the Lord says, I'll be back, I'll be right there on the spot, and you're going to get out of here. What would you change? Would it convict you to do anything that God has been trying to get us to do? Well, it ought to motivate one thing. If I knew that Jesus Christ would come in tomorrow, I probably wouldn't try to win more souls than I've won. I'd try to be a better testimony than I've ever been in my life. I would let everybody see Jesus Christ in me, the hope of glory. But we're, we're going around and we're worried about everything, but people are dying and going to hell by the groves, and what are we doing about it? You're saved, sealed, and delivered, right? And you can't lose your salvation if you want to go back on it. Amen. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses not from some, but from all our sin. Amen. If that is the case, why are we not telling others more about it? Say, I'm saved. How many saved this morning? I just want to see your hand, please. Let me see. All y'all are saved. You're sealed. You couldn't go to hell if you wanted to. Amen. Why? The blood of Jesus Christ, either he's telling you the truth or he lied. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. How many trusted in Jesus Christ to save you? Amen. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So you know what? It ought to motivate you to try to win someone to Jesus Christ because, you know, one of these days you're going to stand before a holy, perfect, righteous God and say, hey, you know, I came down to save this lost. And I left you, as I did the disciples, to be a witness for me. It ought to motivate you to win souls. It ought to motivate you. As I said, that sales manager would say, well, you know, uh, 
if you would do this, Brother Ron, if you would sell this many cars, here's what we're going to, we're going to give you an extra $2,000. Now, I don't know about you. <laughs> that motivated me. You say what? I, I had a little bit more giddy up in my step. I would go out there and I would shake hands with everybody that was around. I grabbed the salesman hand if I could sell him something. Uh, two grand back then was a lot of money. It still is today. But it was, I mean, back in when you were selling the Mitel T's. No, just kidding. If I could get you all to smile, it would make me feel better. But it, it would make me, it would motivate me to do some. Hey, let me ask you a question. Would it motivate you to see somebody that you were a witness to? That you witnessed to? Maybe they didn't get saved at that time, but later on they said, your testimony and your walk caused me to come out and go to Christ. You say, there's going to be some surprises up there. Yeah, well, you might surprise someone when you get there. Amen. You know why? Because not by works of righteousness, not something you do, but something he did. You say, well, what do I have to do? Just take him. Amen. It ought to motivate. The second coming ought to motivate us to win souls. Hell motivates soul winning. Do you know that? I wouldn't want to see my worst enemy go to hell. I don't know what enemies I got. I'm sure I've lined up after 80 years and had a few. But I don't know the enemies I got, but I wouldn't want them to go to hell, Brother Ron. Not me. No, why? It's already been paid for, man. Your, your sins have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't have to worry about them anymore. Listen, what is it? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Boy, what a blessing that is. The second coming makes me think of people going to hell. Heaven motivates me. Amen. Why? Because I don't want to see anybody miss it. Amen. My wife and I like to watch these uh, home building things. <laughs> and... Uh, People build homes that we'll never be able to talk about. I mean, it's nice to see. But everybody is trying to make this palatial mansion. You know, how much is that going to cost? $2.5 million. <laughs> Are you kidding? You couldn't buy one square foot for $2.5 million in heaven. Why? It's called street, not streets, street of how about this? Singular. Gate of, not pearls, pearls. Hello? Say, so how big is it? I don't know, but I'd hate to be the one who had to give it up. Amen. <laughs> Think about it. Man, I'd hate to be the one who had to give that oyster, had to give that thing up, man. <laughs> Gate of pearl, streets of gold. There's no more sin, no more sadness, no more, no more sorrow. Never have to say goodbye to your loved ones. Never have to worry about sin anymore. Never have to deal with it. Listen, it ought to motivate us to do something. It ought to motivate you. Because of what he did for you, you should do for him. Amen. You know what? He came to be sin for us who knew no sin. The purpose of that is to make us the righteous of God in him. You're his ambassador, if you will. You need to let people know, not tell people. Let them see Jesus Christ in you, the hope of glory. It ought to motivate some things in your life. Heaven motivates me. When I think of that glory that will be like, it makes me think of we'll be more, no more tears, no more sadness, no more sorrow, no more sickness. And people will not be solemn. First time you ever see him. Now, I, I, I'm a little guy. I got a big mouth. I know it. But I don't know the day I see him, the moment, the second I see him. As a lamb slain. Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. Took your sin at the cross of Calvary. Guess what? When you see him what he's done for you. That ought to motivate you. When I think about the, its glory and what it'll be like, it makes me think there'll be no more tears. 
about this? If there's no tears, all there can be is joy. If there's no tears, there can be nothing but joy. Amen? Like, can, you, can you imagine up there, they're just praising God? Amen. They'll be up there going, <laughs> that's him. That's the one who died for me. That's the one who put up with me. That's the one who said that I give unto you eternal life. Hey, the one who took my sin, both past, present, and future. What have you done for him? It motivates soul winning. It makes me think of more, no more tears. The gratitude should motivate you. Paul never got over Acts chapter 9. When he stood up before King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, what did he say? His mind drifted back, Brother Ron, to Acts chapter 9. On the way down that road, there was a light shined round about me. You remember the day you got saved? Hello? Only one person got saved? Well, let's turn this around. Let's preach at you then. You remember the day you got saved? If you remember the day you got saved, there was a load that was lifted up off of you. You remember when that thing cooked? Man, when I got saved, I'm telling you what, uh, they thought I was trying to get out of it, and they said, don't stop here now. we got to go back in that room. Let's get it done. I said, man, you don't understand. I, I, I had a burden of sin and weight of sin around me, but it's gone now. It's no longer there. I, I don't understand it all. I, I was standing there, a grown man crying. I did not know what I was crying about. Battle had him rage. The devil said, you'll lose every friend you've got. But Jesus said, what a friend you have in me. Amen. And I looked at that thing. Buddy Cargill put his arm around me, and we got down on our knees. And I got S-A-V-E-D. Well, what a blessing. It ought to produce some things in our life, brethren. I thought maybe it could be in six or... It ought to promote faith in us. I don't know about you. When I got saved, I wanted to hear everything I could about him. He's your friend, right? He's your savior, right? Didn't you want to know more about him? Didn't you want to know what he liked and what he didn't like, what he wanted from me and what he wanted to get out of me and what I could do for him? Listen, I, I don't know about you. I, I saw an article one time where a lady uh, was out in the boat, and the boat capsized, and she's down, and you know how it goes. She was getting down for the count, and all of a sudden this man saw her over there, and he come with a speedboat and got and grabbed a hold of her. She was getting ready to go down for the third time. You know what she said? I'll never forget you and what you did for me. Never. And I'll be the best friend you ever had. Because I was dying and you gave me life. It ought to promote some things in your life. What? Hebrews 10, verse 25 says, Not forsaking the symbol of ourselves together as some manner of so some is, but exhorting one another as so much the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. He was saying, let's be faithful so we can encourage each other. We're not to discourage each other. We are there to encourage each other. Matt, brother, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you want some qualifications? Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of. We're Bible believers. Let's be Bible doers. Amen. I have my faults. I am a, I look at them and you ever just get tired of yourself? I do. Y'all don't have to say anything. I get tired of me. I get tired of me complaining, whining, and moaning. And you know what? I got, I won the door prize, Andy. Amen. I got heaven. <laughs> Amen. Flesh and blood shall not inherit it. The what? Amen. 
I don't deserve anything, but he saved me. And you know what? I want to serve him the best I can. I want to stand with him. I want to walk with him. I want him to know that my heart, I don't have anything. Listen, I don't have nothing that he can't, by the grace of God, have. You say, well, would you give up? And if I don't give it up, he'll take it anyway. I'd rather give it up than have him take it from me. He was saying, let's be faithful. Why? Because faithfulness, watch it, not only encourages the sinner, but it encourages the saints. It does. I'm... A lot of people try to get away from church. I don't know. You say, well, you're preaching. Can I tell you I get more when I'm sitting than when I'm standing? You say, what preacher? Any preacher that comes in here. Why? Because I need to be preached at too. I need to, to be get that preaching. And you know what? Ask most pastors. Ask the evangelists. You know what they find going around? A lot of times the pastor needs the preacher more than the people. I'm just being honest with you. I'm not perfect, but I have a perfect Savior. I'm not getting there because of me. I couldn't get out this room. I couldn't get down from this pulpit by my grace, but I can through his. The Bible says I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Brethren, it ought to promote faithfulness. Faithfulness does two things. It puts you in a position to receive the blessings of God. I don't know about you. I, I like it when it gets thick. I, I went down, and I told you guys the other night about this, but I went down, and, and I can only imagine. I asked Miss Vicky this morning. I said, Howard having a good time down there? He's down what they call in Pensacola a blowout. Now, a blowout is not tires blowing up. A blowout is when they just go berserk. You say, well, that's charismatic. No, but it's fun. I've been there. lady in our church wanted to go. She got saved. She hadn't been saved. She came out of Catholicism. Hadn't been saved three or four weeks, and I was preaching one of those blowouts. And I went down there, and that one, <laughs> they brought the choir up then, and they, <laughs> the choir started singing, and those people in there went absolutely stupid crazy. You remember? Anybody remember that? And they were shouting, running. One of the preacher friends of mine, David Walker, he's preaching down there right now. One of my preacher friends, he jumped up on the pew, Brother Ron, and he put his foot on the back pew, jumped over that thing and started running around. Glory to God! Glory to God! Let me tell you something. Don't ever get over being saved. Don't ever get over what he's been and done for you. Why? Because others can see Jesus Christ in you. What caused me to want it? Because I, I just talked to my buddy again the other night. They're bringing his wife home. He says, all the glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, can I tell you something? We're saved. We let, the Bible says, let Jesus Christ be seen in us. The hope. The hope. Those people have no hope without Jesus, they have nothing to look forward to but hell, the hope of glory. It ought to promote faithfulness. Faithfulness does two things. We're hiding the gospel from others by our unfaithfulness. Let me say, it ought to produce purity. In 1 John 3.3, 3, it says, Every man hath his hope in him purify himself even as he is pure. Pure. A Christian, you're not going to be perfect, but you can strive to do right. You're not going to be perfect. You ever met a perfect Christian? <laughs> if you have, please don't tell them. <laughs> Ain't nobody perfect. The one was perfect, brother. They put on the cross. He's the one that went to your, he made him to be sin for us and knew no sin. He was the perfect one. He never sinned. You know, anybody ever heard of peccability, impeccability? Anybody ever heard that? 
impeccable. He was all man, but yet he was God. And here's what they said. He couldn't have sinned. Well, what kind of victory is that? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For you have made him to be sin. You know what he had to do? Now think about this, please. You need to let people know, okay, I'm not perfect. I'm striving every day to battle this flesh, and I'm trying to walk with Jesus Christ. But, you know, I stumble. I mess up. I make, but I have a Savior who was perfect. That's how I'm, I'm getting in on him, not on me. I'm getting on in his life, not on my life. I, if we walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. What a thing. Purity. It ought to bring comfort to the saints. Wherefore, he says in 1 Thessalonians 4.18, comfort one another with these words. This book brings conviction. It'll bring blood if you're not careful. But if you read it, it'll give you comfort. It'll put you on the right course. It'll tell you what you need to do. Yes, sir. See that book right there? He put that together for you and I. That's our instruction manual. Tells us what to do, how to do it, when to do it. Brethren, we need to learn how to do some things. Why? Because it ain't about us. It's about him. It's a, yeah, Look, if he can become sin for us, if he can do things for us, anybody a sinner? Whoa. Oh, come on. Come on. Some of y'all go, <laughs> yeah. Anybody here a sinner? Only a sinner saved by. He hath made him to be sin for us. He knew no sin. That's a heck of a statement. Did Jesus Christ ever sin? He never even thought the wrong, a wrong thought. He couldn't have had a sinner and we're, eat, drink, be merry, for more we die. What should the second coming? You know, most people don't believe in it. It ought to bring comfort. Wherefore, in verse 18 of 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. I uh, don't mean to bring up old things, but when Curtis was passing away, I was present there with Miss Connie. <laughs> he lay back and she gave him whatever the medication was. And he, about 10 minutes later, he popped up and says, wait a minute, this ain't heaven. Where did he find that out at? And then later on, he passed away. See what? He was looking forward to getting there. You know what he would tell you today? Don't miss it. It's everything it said it was and more. He looked at me. Listen. The Lord Jesus Christ had people who were telling him, don't go to the cross, don't do this. Brother Ronnie said, I must be about my father's business. Everything that tried to stop him from doing it, he looked at one thing. Father sent me for a purpose. He sent me to die for sinners. We're sinners saved by the grace of God. There are people out there today. As I'm talking right now, people have died and sliding into hell. What are we doing? If we think the Lord would come today, tomorrow, next week, what have we done in preparation for that? Say, I'm prepared. I'm, hey, preacher, I got that thing right years ago. Yeah, but how about your next door neighbor? How about the guy or the lady that you go to for the cleaners or to the grocery store or a friend or family? 
How about that? I remember when we started at Wegman. One of the sweetest times is when somebody comes to Christ and you and Herbie and God, God, there's five of them went back in one night and got down and said, Lord, if I ain't right, I'm getting it right right now. You know what? In this world, you should have tribulation, but be of good cheer for God overcame it. Brethren, I'll tell you something. It ought to comfort the saints. I'm not perfect. Amen. I got more, but it ought to convict the sinner. Amen. Buddy Cargill, I've told you this before. I worked in Williamsburg, Virginia every once in a while. I was a rodman, but I actually, my expertise were more in the cable, free stress cable work. And so anytime there was a cable job, they wanted to make sure I was down there. Um, the, the deal behind most parking lots you see, if they have the sparrow columns, you'll notice that most parking lots, in order to get more space out of them, they'll use cables because you can pour less concrete. And so when we would do things like that, we were in Williamsburg, Virginia, and um, I was lost. So I know what I'm talking about. I remember Buddy coming out one morning. He had been saved probably less than a year, I would think. And he was just so excited to be saved. You got to understand, an old drug peddler, an old drug druggie who got saved by the grace of God. We got out there one, one morning. I'm standing outside waiting for him to come down because we rode over to the job site in his truck. And he looks up, so Ron in the air and says, How about the day, Lord? I thought, wow, what in the world is he talking about? I say, didn't you know? I, I was religious. I wasn't saved. I religiously sinned, I religiously did everything wrong, but I wasn't saved. And I went and asked Buddy, and he told me for the first time about Jesus Christ. He said, you, come on, that's, I'm telling you, for the first time, I heard that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. Wasn't, I didn't get saved that day. It wasn't long after that. I went to church with him, Larry Whitaker, and his family, Sidney Whitaker. And uh, the preacher preached. I couldn't even tell you what he preached. They had witnessed to me and told me so many things. I was trying to get it all worked up in my head. And I got convicted to a point now. I, 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 it must be the older you get, the more you cry. I don't know. I, I, tears come easy, but they didn't then. I was hardened. And the devil said, if you go up there, you'll lose every friend you got. I thought, yeah, well, who would I hang with? Later on, I figured out, Hanging with Jesus Christ better than anything you can do. Amen. I went back that day, Brother Ron got saved. And the moment I got saved, I realized the best friend I ever had was him. Because the rest of them were like, well, when we worked on the job site, every morning they would a group would meet over here and a group would meet here. These were saved people. You know what they were doing? They were praying. They were praying, Lord, give us a good day. Help us get through this day. But help us to be more of a testimony to you today that we might show others Jesus Christ. And I remember that walk, that walk from there, from that, and I was going into the wrong crowd, and Buddy Carr goes, hey, Bob, Bob, over here. It was just something I did. And I walked over there, and we got got down and prayed. And I said, Lord, I can't believe you would die for me. And 
I'll try to do the best I can. Brethren, I'm going to tell you something this morning. People say, well, the second coming is no big deal. Okay. But you know what? It is to a lot of people. If you knew the Lord was coming today, what would you do? What would you change? How would you react? Does people know that you're saved? Do they know that he's coming? Do they know the blood of Jesus Christ? cleanses us from all sin, not part of it. See, if you go into a church, you go into Catholicism, you know what it does? It says, well, you go into the priest and you ask him to, you know, he gives you all these prayers to say. The Bible says, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and look at Acts chapter 16, Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. I'm trying to tell you something this morning. There are things that you can do in your daily walk, in your talk, in your service for the Lord that ought to produce some things for him. It isn't just about you. It's about him. He came to seek and to save. We've been given, given a job to do. Whether we go to hang things on the door whether you go to nursing homes, whether you go to the street preaching, every time you do something, your objective is to let people see Jesus Christ in you. Amen. The second coming, I may believe he's coming. One person believes it. How many believe he's coming? Would it be all right if he came today? No? Would it be all right if he came right now? Amen. I, I wouldn't have to go to the doctors anymore. That'd be a blessing. If you believed he was coming right now, I've watched people, oh, so and so's coming over to the house and you know, clean the house and get everything all ready and get the nice clothes on. If you knew he was coming today, what would it change in your life? Think about it. What would it do? Your neighbors know you're saved. Your friend, does your enemies know <laughs> you're saved? Had a guy tell me one time, I just don't like you. And I said, can I be honest with you? I don't like me either. But he loved me and died for me. Father, I know you... Many times in the Word of God, you said you were coming. Many times you have said things about you're coming to get us. And you said that, that where I am, there we may be also. Lord, I'm grateful for the idea that you will be coming to get us out of here. So, Father, would you do us a favor? Help us to be convicted that this lost world is watching us. Help us to know that because of what they said in 1 Thessalonians, because of what you said, because you said that one day you're coming back to get us. You said you're going to prepare a place for us. And you said that where I am, there you may be also. Wherever you're at, Lord, that's where I want to be. Help our folks to be witnesses. I want to ask you a question. How many people right now would say this? Preacher, I'm thinking of somebody right now that I could be and should be witnessing to. I'm thinking of family. I want to pray that they'll get in. One, anybody else? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I want my family to get in. I want him to find me doing something for him. He's done so much for me. Father, I pray you bless it now in the invitation in Jesus' name. Amen.
Close us in prayer.